So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Cheers. Cheers. All right, Michael. Just like last episode, no first impressions. We're getting right into the good stuff. The nitty and the gritty. We're at number five on our top lists. What's your number five? The best stuff of the year. Right here. My number five is... They're not in any position to take care of anyone but themselves right now. My mom told me you guys had a lot going on, but I had no idea. This is a really bad time for me to be crashing here. No, not at all. Really? Because I have friends in Bushwick. No, no, we're so glad that you're here. Dreams are nothing more than... So how's college going? Everyone is so convinced of their own artistic promise. And I'm like, hey, my uncle is an award-winning theater genius. And my aunt is a real-life playwright. And they're over 40 and still have to live in a rent-stabilized apartment on Avenue A with like drunks and graffiti in the front. So don't talk to me about the sacrifices you're making to be an artist, okay? Private Life, directed by Tamara Jenkins, a Netflix title. Catherine Hahn, Paul Giamatti, Keely Carter, already talked about her. I love this movie. It's a bold choice. I like it. Really love this movie. I think this is one that I worry about as being written off as a small film small film which i disagree with i think it's just about something very specific i think it is a small film Mm -hmm. though like your other choices uh support the girls Mm -hmm. um the writer and um Mm -hmm. what's the what's charlie Plummer one again lean on pete lean on pete i think Mm -hmm. aren't they all small films i would say that they have a an outsized emotional impact for me relative to what they do no i don't mean Um, um that america should treat them as small mm -hmm. films but I, mm -hmm. i do think that compositionally they are small Mm. in scope and small in budget scale perhaps yeah um but um to me this really well covers both comedy and dramatic ground um the frustration that these two characters face together as they try to have a baby and um are resilient and determined nonetheless has um stuck with me and moved me and it made me laugh um, Kaylee Carter was just a terrific supporting character. I believed her um, desire to help them conceive um, was um, just really s- startlingly sincere. And the um, naivete that they um, sort of attribute to her character, I think, is really funny, but never even remotely close to cruel. Mm-hmm. It just um, treats her like a young person yeah, real. eager to help um a really a adult situation um and she is an adult i don't i don't want to belittle her i'm just saying um she's not fully matured yet from a biological she's standpoint. in a little bit over her head yeah. perhaps and rushing um into something that is going to be very emotionally complicated and i think it works that for both humor and really human drama um in great ways really smart dialogue um i loved it private life if you want to zoom out a little bit and just Mm. talk about it as a as a picture Mm. it's one of the most authentic pictures um Mm. you didn't mention either of them Catherine hahn and paul Mm. giamatti uh are i'm amazed this didn't come up in your ensembles now that i reflect back on the film very but i think paul giamatti's turn here is my favorite since uh shoot what's that flick that he did with cronenberg 20 12 2013 with uh Ooh. robert pattinson and uh sarah gadon um shoot he's in the, i think i know that one cosmopolis it's my favorite oh, turn from him since one. cosmopolis and Catherine hahn is just as good as she's always been whether it's stepbrothers or i love dick or, or whatever you want to pick it, yeah. she's just so fucking good great choice yeah it, it's great i stuff. don't even think in my top 30 but oof brutal it, it could certainly you know, it's it's in that Roger, um, the Mr. Rogers documentary for me, where it's mm. like, I really like this film. I just didn't personally, it's not personally something that I would ever mm. love. It's just mm. not of that kind, the way that Sport the Girls is. Yeah. How about you? Number five. Number five is a film that I promised we'd talk about last episode. We're talking about it, and we'll talk about it again. I'm sorry, baby. I didn't mean that have you. I love you. You know that. I do. And I understand what you're going through because I'm with you. 
The things that tormented me the most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive. If Beale Street could talk. There it is. There it is. Barry Jenkins, uh, cinematic language is one of my favorite cinematic languages that's emerged this decade. Um, I think that it's as important as Spielberg's development in cinematic language as I've seen during my lifetime. Um, and it's just beautiful. It's stirring. Uh, the first third of it, I had a constant urge to weep. Oh yeah. It was not hard to hold back the urge to cry, but it was impossible to make the urge to cry go away for that first third. Mm. And I don't know if that was simply the score or the visuals or if it was the pairing of the two but what what Barry does is what Barry does and it's fucking beautiful it's it's just one of the most touching most human most authentic beautiful things that I've seen all year and I'm I'm so glad that I got to see it Kiki Lane is so amazing as the lead actress uh Stephen James is so earn just that there's I don't even know how to put it, but there's something about Stephen James's smile. That it just it breaks me. And then those dads. Mm. As I oh, put yeah. in my review, I would like to imagine those dads are still planning scores at the bar to this day. Sitting at the corner, drinking, talking about how they're gonna afford their children and their grandchild while they drink beer, which is very funny because how can they afford to drink beer at a bar if they can't afford anything else <laughs> exactly <laughs> but they'll make it work the way they always have mm-hmm. and Regina King but we'll we'll get back to it yep it's a great pick Thank we you. will I, one that I somehow did not make my ensembles probably just because it didn't cross my mind in that 10 minute period yeah and it deserved yeah, to be we, on we, number one probably we made mm-hmm. a, a bunch of snapshot decisions didn't we mm-hmm. um, so let's go to top three docs let's do it Counting down from number three. I didn't see as many docs this year as I would have liked. Um, Me neither. You saw ones that I didn't. I saw ones you didn't. Yeah. Um, and we both ended up missing about 20 of the good ones. Yeah, absolutely. But at number three, I have Won't You Be My Neighbor about Mr. Rogers. Um, formally speaking, I don't know that there's a lot here for... Um, me to to heat praise on i just think it does exactly what it needs to do to uh show us what mr rogers as a guy was really like and how kind compassionate empathetic um and devoted to children he was and it um totally snuck up on me i was 100% 100% expecting something overly sentimental that I was going to roll my eyes at, and it totally bowled me over emotionally. Um, uh, one that uh, I fully expect many people to love. I agree. Um, w- my personal experience with it at the theater was it's the only film all year where me and everyone in the theater with me didn't move after the movie. The credits rolled screen went black and then everyone got up no mm. one left no no one left for a bathroom break it, it was so unique and, and jarring that it's burned into my memory oh yeah what a, a guy it's a good choice I, for some reason i'm a dark person i think mm. and just how happy of a documentary it was just doesn't really jive with me yeah it wasn't mm. negative <laughs> Fair there's enough. Something, there's something Mr. Rogers there. wasn't mean enough for you? There's not enough darkness. <laughs> uh, my number three is They'll Love Me When I'm Dead. Nothing mm. dark about this doc. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, I will not have another chance to mention The Other Side of the Wind, so I'll just say this is kind of the way that I was able to get mm. The Other Side of the Wind into my list in some way. Um, and... I was really affected by this documentary um, when I watched it. I don't think about it very often, but when I do think about it, I I think about how it affected me emotionally, and I'm really glad that it's there. That's really all I got. Love it. Great pick. My number two is Hale County This Morning, This Evening. Which Which I could have seen or could see tomorrow, but will not. 
<laughs> oh, that's right. It's part of the documentary fest. Yeah. That's 11 right. 11 a.m., but I don't want to go pay for parking at 11 One and only one showtime? Yeah, it's my one and only day to sleep in tomorrow, and I'm just mm. going to sleep in. Fuck it. Sleepover <laughs> movies. We love drinking. We love movies. We also love sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, I was a big fan of this one. Short doc. I think it's only 90 minutes or so. Um, Ramel Ross is following the lives of um, a handful of folks in Alabama, um, it was, um, the, in a, from a formal standpoint, just sort of the most, um, fresh and new feeling documentary that I saw this year and, and maybe in a long time. It looked really um, exciting. Can yeah. you, can you give me just a gist of it? Yeah. Well, he's following, um, mostly a handful of young people who I want to say are probably late teens, early twenties, um, a handful of the boys are uh, basketball players hoping to make a go at it in college. Mm. Um, one of them is uh, just getting married, just had a young kid. Okay. Um, and a bit of minding the gap in there. A little bit, except that I would say it's maybe even a bit more collage-like. I think there is a much clearer mm. narrative through line to minding the gap. Oh, kind of like your favorite so. filmmaker, Adam McKay, who just recently released mm. Vice. We'll also talk about that later, yeah. I think. <laughs> Um, but, um, he just finds really sort of, um, interesting ways of looking at these people. Um, and it thus gives you this really sort of unique feeling about what it is like to, um, uh, live their lives in Alabama. Um, there's a, an extended long take in a locker room as the boys are getting ready for a basketball game. I want to say it's like five minutes long. The camera just sits in a corner of the locker room and Very you see these lovely. guys um uh you know kind of jostling with each other kind of getting psyched up for the game um and uh it's just at first you're kind of thinking to yourself like i don't think anything's happening here and then it's only until the last minute where there's sort of this wiseman effect where you're like something happened in these five minutes something about the anticipation of the game something about what these guys um, how comfortable they are together. Their energy That level. only time can kind of reveal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, he's a first-time filmmaker. Is, that's my understanding. Um, it is so sort of experimental that um, I do think it's, it's almost kind of like pushing the boundary. Like, I almost wonder if he um, might risk going too far down this road. Um, is there it experimental is some, in the way that I think you express rat film is experimental? Yeah, to some degree. I think uh, I think I like rat film maybe a little bit better. Um, but um, for example, he uh, he put some some title cards throughout the film with questions, and they're always sort of these um, very sort of kind of vague um, meta metaphys metaphysical kind of questions. Um, I don't know that all of those really led me to believe he knew exactly what he was doing with some of these questions but I think the movie becomes something sort of nonetheless um, mm -hmm. so I'm interested to see what he might do next um, and if this is maybe as far as you can kind of go with this sort of experimental Style. Um, doc approach but um, really interesting so I have one more question for you I think I have the title right Hale County the morning is this evening or this morning um, is the evening Hale County this morning, comma, this evening. Oh, okay. I mm. didn't see the comma, and I was oh. wondering if there, if his collage style kind of makes it so that so that they end up becoming more of a, a portrait of who they are over mm. time, in the way that I would maybe argue wildlife accomplishes. If, mm. if, walking away from this film, you feel like you got a portrait of... A, a portrait that you might be able to overlay on most of the, perhaps, Midwest... Um, high school aspiring to be college basketball players. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the essence of time is definitely pretty critical to this movie and, like, kind of what the future holds for these kids and then also their kids as it kind of spends a lot of time with one of these, like, with a toddler um, mm -hmm. that one of these basketball players has. Um, and it kind of reminds me in a way a little bit of Monrovia about um, 
Yeah, it sounds like Some, Monroe, somebody yeah. somebody passes away in this film. Um, that scene kind of reminds me of the ending of Monrovia, um, where we watch uh, someone returning to the ground. You say Monrovia, um, my stomach growls. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I think Josh Larson talked about his favorite moment as this one where like a kid is um, in the bathtub holding a, a bubble, and that superimposed then with this image of the moon. Um, that it cuts away to. So sort of this just kind of circularity of time and age and that sort of thing. Yeah, metaphysical sort of, yeah. Uh, shapes and truths. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's one that's on here because I don't think I've entirely figured it out yet. And it does one, it, it does kind of call me back to it. Yeah, for sure. That's my number two. How about you? My number two is a... Um, once again, a, a break in whether or not it's a documentary, mm. but it's certainly a docu series at the very least. It is Netflix's Wild Wild Country, oh, yeah. produced by the Duplass brothers. Um, I started it, didn't know what I was in for, and when I finished it, I still didn't really finish comprehending what I think, and I still don't. I still think a lot of different things, um, but. I, I love it. I love the style. I love the found footage um, assembly. I respect it so much. I respect the interview style that they went back with and how they were um, really uh, not trying to to play kind to the interview subjects. Mm. Um, you know, like they, they would have to certainly watch what they asked and watch how they asked it, it dealing with some of these lunatics that were part of a cult and are still maybe part of this cult um, in different ways. But it it's, you know, I, I th- think in my review, God, back in January, February, I, I said that I, I long for the day that I see this about Scientology, mm. um, this type of a thing where it's found footage and this r- cult religion is dead and now we're, we're going through and and finding out the deeper machinations of who did what, who poisoned who, who brought the hobos where, um, what was the agenda politically to take over this county, um, mm. what was the vision of this, like what did they actually think they were going to be able to get away with? Because it is so fascinating to watch egomaniacal systems work at a um, multiplicity type of a level instead of mm. a singular level. You know, we get a lot of Manson stuff now mm. where we see like the individual go crazy. Um, and, and maybe he has a cult, but we rarely see the true extent of the crazy people in the cult. Mm, and yeah. I, I really liked this documentary because of what it did there. Yeah. Uh, like a 10 episode, one hour long kind of series? Something like I that? I really don't remember. I think it was more like four or six. And I oh, think okay. that the, um, the episode length varied. But one very fun fact, mm. uh, there are a few moments where we see uh, 1980s. Christopher Hitchens mm. doing some work for the BBC um, in India um, where he shows up right as uh, who I don't remember the, the fellow's name who starts this cult is uh, is being indicted and investigated for tax fraud and tax evasion and stealing mm. money um, which is right when he leaves and goes to Oregon um, or maybe it's the 70s I, I can't remember but uh, yeah Hitch if you're a fan of Christopher Hitchens is in this documentary I like it. I love it. Blind spot for me. One I need to catch up with. My number one, which I am guessing is your number one. It's my number one kind of by a mile is Mind in the Gap. Yep. We agree? We agree. Ah. We don't even need to go back to mine. We'll just talk about Mind in the Gap together now. Yep. It is great, isn't it? We talked about it on the show. Um, It has received heaps of praise throughout. It's almost one of my top films. I really feel like it would be on there if I were to just mix up the two categories. Um, it's received heaps of praise throughout award season already, all well deserved. Um, I think Bing Lou's touch is, is unique and fresh. Um, really st- stunning cinematography. I don't, I don't remember how much we talked about that, just how great this film looks um, yeah. and how smooth some of that skateboard footage is. Did, did you get the um, chance to hear um, the interview that I think Adam or Josh did with him? On film oh, no, I don't think I did. Where he kind of gets into the extent of the types of cameras that he'd been practicing with for years. Mm. Um, be, because he's using this really specific camera. I don't remember what it's called. Um, but all that footage where they're skating, 
Mm. I believe, if I remember correctly, he's running the whole time. And that opening oh, yeah. s- opening shot, they tried to shoot it the first time, and he like forgot to hit record. Oh, devastating. So they had to go back and redo the whole thing. So Bing had to run that whole stretch <laughs> twice. doing it. And just, I, this is one of those things where you know, the more you know about it, the more just deepens your appreciation of it um, 100%. and and for some reason elevates it it's already pretty high but once you understand more about about it the way that uh, i was talking about with mission impossible fallout mm-hmm. it just creeps up and up and up in appreciation for because otherwise if he didn't do all this stuff we wouldn't have gotten it yeah and i'm so glad we did me too um I'll be eager to see what uh, he does next. I think we talked about that a little bit already, but it does feel like the kind of thing that's so personal. It's like, where, where, what where, do you can do Can he do something next? Yeah. Or does he need to try his hand at a feature or maybe, yeah. you know, go shoot an episode of Atlanta or something where where there's a system in place and he can bring his original authorial vision to it, but it'll still, yeah. you know, seam itself in. Yeah. I, I was thinking, I'd like to see his take on a Black Mirror. Because mm. um, Black Mirror has recently announced that they're going to be trying to do a more positive leaning mm. um, episodes, I- at least in mm. the coming seasons that they've announced. And I was just thinking, Bing's kind of got this really positive angle to him, even though he's touching on this really, really dark stuff. It's still filled with hope and, and this deep, compassionate mm. humanity that yeah. I, I would like to see him in an anthology series like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard at the same time I, I might want him to do cinematography I think he's got a, a yeah. touch with the camera itself he does um, so I, I could see I would happily watch him in either role yeah. great doc my favorite and yours I think that we're on number four are you prepared to give us your number four feature film of the year I am my number four is Terminator don't you ever raise your voice to me Ari Aster's Hereditary. My number 11 film of the year. Oh, It used so to be my number three. So what happened? And then this morning came around. Uh, did you rewatch it? I did rewatch it. And, and it I fell a little bit. I it since, and then this morning I was like... <laughs> did did it slip or did other things just pass it revisiting it um took away the the monumental shadow of impressiveness in my mind mm. and i began to realize that what it does while incredible does not outdo mission impossible mm. it does not outdo for me support the girls mm. it does not outdo for me you, you know these other titles that, that i've mentioned like it um it just it doesn't outdo Suspiria which I haven't mentioned yet like Mm. there's just some stuff that I love more but technically Mm. he's he's gonna come up in a list that we have later (laughs) yeah yeah I'll put it that way um Alex Wolf the kid he's new to me I'm not I'm not terribly familiar is it Alex Wolf or is it Nat Wolf I can't remember which one's the brother did I say Alex Wolf or did I say you said Alex Wolf. Wolf let's see Alex, okay. right? There is a Nat Wolf. They're yeah. brothers. Yeah, ah, I they didn't even exactly put that together. The same. Yep. I think that I might have called him Nat Wolf in my review, so I fucked. Up. Ah, got it. Sorry, Letterbox. Uh, he was very close to uh, getting to the getting into our stars are born category mm. for me. I don't know if he has uh, much prior experience or not, but he certainly came to mind. Um, I think he and Tony Collette are 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 kind of incredible together. Um, and as we already talked about, just something about how well that aesthetic that Aster has, where he's flipping between seeing the house as a house and as a dollhouse, and how that mm-hmm. formal scheme fits so well with what this story is about, this family being manipulated and kind of coming undone. Um, I think that's just the mark of... Um, a great filmmaker who can apply the form and allow it to cohere so clearly it's one of the with most what technically impressive with what he's doing narratively. Ever. Um, yeah, we talked about it on some episode. Go back through the catalog; mm. it's great. I love it. Small thing, Gabriel Byrne, amazing. Mm. 
when I rewatched it, I, it definitely held up for me. Nothing compares to a theatrical viewing of mm-hmm. this kind of movie. Um, but um, it, it definitely held up for me on a second rewatch. It, it did not fall. Mm-hmm. It just didn't raise. You know, it was like... Um, all, all, it, because I, I think with some films, there are l- shadows from them if you see mm-hmm. them in theaters. Um, particularly for me, like when I saw Ready Player One in IMAX 3D, that mm-hmm. movie had a big ass shadow because mm-hmm. it was so technically stunning in that IMAX 3D shining sequence. Oh yeah. But I revisited it in 2D and it's like, this is fucking boring. Yeah. You know, like it's got fun moments, but it's, it's overall boring and too long. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's a solid three, but it's not something special. And for me, yeah. Hereditary just, I removed the shadow. It's. I think it's a five for me. It's like 96, mm. you know, it's just when I think about like movies that I want to revisit, it maybe is number 11, not number 10. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. All right. What do you got um, at number, number four? number four is I think one of the films that will hold up the best. Um, I think last year, um, Peter Labuza gave me this word that I'm going to use. Perfect shot-itis. Mm. Yeah, it's a terrible symptom that. <laughs> Alfonso Cuarón's Roma suffers from mm. so many perfect shot itises. Ooh so many there's just so many it's such a it's such a sweeping film of human emotion integrity and uh evolution of of expressing oneself and and all those silent moments of of sadness where you feel alone and really there's people with you suffering with you but they can't tell you because you have to bear your load alone and Mm. um when, when i think about you know if i were to commission a statue to be made to Mm. a film from Mm. this year i think the statue i would ask for would be from roma and it would be Mm. that cover of Mm. them hugging each other on the beach Mm. and i would want it in every city square in the world (laughs) hover the nation exactly it's a great movie i'm shocked that it wasn't even higher i thought it would be well there's only one more feature film oh got it on my list Wow. So it's wow. I, I even still I thought that was I thought that would be the number one feature film. Yeah. Very well, interesting. I revisited my number one feature film uh, mm. since I watched Roma, and mm. it just really solidified for me what it does story wise. So you'll see. Awesome. I yeah, like it. We'll see. Uh, so what are we at? Top three official soundtracks. That's correct. All right. Let's just uh, break it down quick unless we've got something we haven't gotten to yet because i think we got to most of them um number three for you number three shirkers a documentary shocked me but revisited it love this score oh yeah uh, it does the... have a good score but better than wow okay. yeah well i absolutely. guess i'll have to see what your number two and one are uh the composer's name is ishai adar um, I don't have composer names. Yeah, I think it's uh, dreamy and atmospheric. It's mostly synths, some hand claps, mm-hmm. and some vocals, no lyrics, just some oohs and ahs that I think fits perfectly with the sense of mystery that she's trying to cultivate. Um, and those those hand claps and uh, the, the, the sort of... Um, human touch to that score fits very well I think with that DIY aesthetic she is applying visually um, I love it sure Do, does the OST or is the OST com- composer you just named is that the guy that was supposed to do the original film I don't think it is okay unfortunately okay. that's just something I wondered. Yeah. Uh, number three bringing it back up if Beale Street could talk mm. my god that music just is breaking and I I still have I'm thinking I woke up thinking about it actually mm. <laughs> um, we will talk about that shortly so number two for you my number two you were never really here Johnny Greenwood so we'll talk about another Radiohead band member here shortly uh-huh. you um, were never really here a, a choice from Jared Bratt one of his favorite films that's right great pick um, I still think when I have time to revisit it this I, I still just have a great 
feeling that this could work its way much higher on my list. Um, there's a hard edge to this score, um, and then occasional moments of relief. I think it fits just immaculately with the um, abrasiveness of that movie. Uh, Johnny Greenwood, great score. It, it, I think it was a good score. I can't remember. Mm. Mm. I was very disaffected by that movie. Um, it is interesting, though. Yeah. Uh, my number two, A Star is Born. Ooh-wee. Never heard Super of it. Super impressive. Great composition. Uh, I can't believe that he directed and performed at the same time. Um, and that that music was composed. Uh, it's just great. And, I mean, Lady Gaga, what else are you asking? Who's that? <laughs> great score. LG, baby. And my number one, If Beale Street Could Talk, Nicholas Bertel, uh, just dazzling, romantic, um, full of feeling. I love it. Uh, my number one is the other Radiohead band member, Tom York. Boom. Uh, holy shit, what a great debut. That's right. This is his debut of official soundtrack in a film, I believe and uh composing for a film and it is a stunning debut and i want lots more i don't want to say johnny greenwood might be outdone but i think that uh johan johansson might have a worthy successor that was uh actually really hard for me to leave off it was uh johan johansson's for uh mandy that was that was definitely an honorable mention i was considering uh mary magdalene myself but oh yeah got in with wounded soldiers yep Um, all right well Shoot, we're on to number three. What is your number three feature film of the year, Michael? If Beale Street Could Talk, directed by Barry Jenkins. I liked this movie. I loved this movie. It was a five out of five for me. Um, yeah, oh, I wanted to follow up with you on that, because we're not going to have a chance to review it on, on the show. Just yeah. a real quick question. Um, you read the book immediately preceding watching the film? Correct. Yeah. Um, do you think that um, that experience and your extra ingrainedness with that world is what leveled it up to a five for you? Or do you think if you mm. watched it independently, it would still remain a five? I know that's hard to logistically work out in your head. It's really hard to separate. It's a very curious question I have. I really think I would have enjoyed it just as much, hmm. even if I had not read the book. Because um, for me, it's that 94, not that 96. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So four and a half. Yeah got it that's yeah but like two points away from a five for me yeah and i was just wondering if it was that two points for you from the book because Mm. you're seeing these people that you're so emotionally invested in from reading the book because you're seeing kiki embody this person and how lovely and and loving she is to fawny um just if that was working maybe in its favor for you I think it just, it, it certainly makes watching the movie more interesting every time you've read the source material. Oh, yeah. Um, but loving it any more or less, I don't know. I, I don't know that I, I would I would say that that's the case. Um, I think it's really interesting just to see, like, what he omitted and what he included. I agree, um, yeah. That, you know, doesn't necessarily make it better or worse for me. It's just interesting. Like, in the book, there's an incident when they're kids when um, Kiki Lane's character... Um, hits Fawny with, like, a stick or something like that. And it's this big, momentous thing where, you know, he's obviously shocked. Yeah. Um, and that uh, would not feel right in this movie. No, it wouldn't. Um, I mean, this yeah. is so It's not composed in such a way that that would work with how they use the flashbacks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I could see where that might fit in as far as, um, like, within the film's composition of frame. Um, there's a moment where she's sitting across from Fawny, and uh, I believe that this is the scene before he um, shows up with his face broken, um, mm. when mm. he kind of has that breakdown, and then he starts saying, I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry. Um, I, I could see the flashback maybe fitting into that moment, Yeah, but I, I think that would kind of undermine um the the goodwill or the good faith that he built up with us yeah yeah i agree and it would just go against his cinematic language as a director yeah i agree i mean there there is a warmth to this movie that i think something like that just might break a little bit um but as a movie about something that's ultimately very sad and disheartening something like a man you know being uh thrown in jail for something he did not commit 
um, it's just shockingly affectionate for its characters. Like, I just feel like this movie cares deeply about its characters. It does. Um, I think it was Michael Phillips who said he wasn't sure if, to him, these just felt like real characters um, who lived and breathed in history to him. And I think I kind of see where he's coming from. Like, the, like, there is something very sort of heightened about all this. But mm-hmm. to me, like, it just feels like a gift through the form from Jenkins to these characters that he yes. just loves. He gives them these spotless clothes, this color, oh, this I score. The it just clothes. feels like, like, I can't take this injustice away, but I can give you this story about mm-hmm. you. Um, and that just, that meant the, the world to me. A small note, the, um, the non-African-American actors, Ed Screen, Pedro Pascal, uh, mm. Diego Luna, Dave Franco, all mm. great. He uses each and every person of a different race. I don't remember the the woman who was raped raped's name. Yeah, but he mm. uses all of them so expertly. Like it, it really just hems the sucker together, um, and and makes it feel like a real world, exp- uh, like it's a, it's a heightened experience, but it feels like a real heightened experience that is completely yeah. calculated. Fighting in the war room that David Ehrlich said to him that Barry Jenkins. Cinema has a long history of documenting black pain, but we we finally have a director who's uh, more interested in documenting black love. Yeah, um, and that that's just, a great point. Um, is that's that's huge. There's Ehrlich with his good one Nice, nice one off. Yep. <laughs> All right, are we back to uh, a sidebar category, or did you uh, give us your number three? I don't think you have. I think I gotta give you the number three. Number three. It's here. It's my favorite adapted screenplay that I can think of off the top of my head this decade. It is my favorite feature film of the year because there won't be a feature film after this. It is... Now I've killed everything that's walked or crawled. If you do it enough, you get used to it. That's what I'm afraid of. You just gotta take your dues. We both know it could just as easily be you sitting here in these chains. Sometimes I envy the finality of death, the certainty, and I have to drive those thoughts away when I'm weak. Hostiles, Mm. and technically it is listed as a 2017 release, and it's arriving here. It is a meditation on stoicism, and it is deeply human and compassionate in a way that I think a, a lot of people were offended by. Um... But there, there are certain moments to me that just unlock this movie, um, and it's, it's sprawl of, of idea. Mm. Um, you know, when you talk about stoicism, you're talking about um, really old stuff. You're talking about Marcus Aurelius. You're talking about Roman Empire, Greek Empire stuff. And there's a moment when Christian Bale is um, told that he has to escort the man that he's been waging a war against his whole adult life back to his homeland to die peacefully um and he walks out of his barracks which are erected in the midst of this sprawling countryside that is just raw nature and in the background thunder is rolling and then there's the small perfect order of the government and the military here and he walks out and he's just at his wits end and it uh, there's something so touching about duty and honor Mm. and uh, it's just really it's a really special moment that I think is mirrored about 20 minutes later when they leave camp with the Native Americans that he has to escort and Wes Studi Mm. is told to get down from his horse and to be bound and uh, and to have his nice clothes taken off of him because they were taking a photo for the press and everything because mm. it was a president's order that he escort these men back or these uh, um, Native Americans back to their their homeland in Montana. And when West Studi is being shackled, the way that he uh, maintains his torso erectness and his chin level and th- the proudness that he brings. Um, I, it was weirdly cathartic and, and moving uh, and I, I just every time I've revisited this film since I've watched it three times now it's just it's one of my favorites yeah it works at so many levels 
it's been forever since I watched it. It was earlier in the year that I watched it, but uh, the cinematography, if nothing else, is most definitely stuck with me. I think it's beautifully shot. Um, I, don't, I don't remember ever reading where they shot uh, most of this film, but um, some really beautiful um, locations that are uh, seamlessly worked in mm-hmm. um, to the narrative. Um, I do. I kind of remember this kind of being mired in. Um, like controversy about like it about the Native Americans, mm-hmm. kind of like Ballad of Buster Scruggs a little yeah. bit. You think there's any credence to it or no? Um, I think that there's a lot less credence to this than to Buster Scruggs, mm. um, just because I kind of did a deep dive on what Wes Studi had to say about his role and what his um, his compatriot Native American actors in the film and just um, Native American actors that are friends with him had to say about it and that they to them it was one of the most from what I've read from those specific people it was one of the most deeply authentic tales of what it was like for Native Americans at this mm. point in time um, because at at the end um, he passes naturally that's not really a big spoiler that's to be expected that's part of the He's plot. He's sick right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the Native American who carries on is very much speaking to now um, mm. And I, I won't say more, but but it, when you, it's very much a, a James Gray type of a film for me, mm. where the more that I think about it, the more it kind of has these James Gray flourishes. Um, and then this one other thing, just real quick, um, yeah. it starts out with adjective. Rosamund mm. Pike is teaching her uh, children what an adjective is, mm. and then a scene unfolds that completely constructs the time, the place, mm. the era everything that the word the ad- that adjective is um, mm. into the film and that is part of the original book mm. and I think that that's just one of those notes where I would point to where it's like this is one of the best adapted screenplays I've ever seen put to film like there's something from the book that made it to the screenplay that made it to the cinematic language of Scott Cooper that is just so special and Christian Bale's a beast book is uh, also called Hostiles, Hostiles yeah. written by Do don't you know? remember Got it. I just uh, I skimmed just it. Curious. I wasn't yeah. able to read it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just started the year where I read a, a book a week. I just finished Cole oh, McCarthy's like Child God yesterday. I started like No Country for Old Men this morning. Mm. So we'll see if I make it to Hostiles. I like it. We can come back to it. Great yeah. pick. All right. Well, we are on the favorite actor and actress lead in supporting. That's right. Where do you want to start? Supporting? Um, wherever you want. Let's do supporting. Um, I'll start with supporting actress because we have already talked about her a little bit um she just kept coming up in multiple categories um thomas and mckenzie was my honorable mention really hard not to put her there i did uh i did find myself even more struck by kaylee carter in private life um i just think what she brings to that movie is critical i it, it was almost hard to not consider her a lead because of how Involved in the narrative she becomes. And how much um, screen time? I, I'd be interested to see a, a graph of Ben Foster to Thomas and McKenzie. I spent so much time looking for a female actress. I promise actress. the Oscars would categorize her as supporting. Don't worry I about it. I think so, Olivia yeah. Olivia Coleman, um, Emma Stone, Rachel Weiss, probably all supporting actresses, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, there was just not a Michelle Williams this year who, I agree. with truly limited screen time, did something really outside. I'm probably I forgetting somebody, you... but... Oh, no. No, you're about to get to her. Never mind. Never mind. Um, but yes, uh, Kaylee Carter, we've talked about her plenty. Um, she's great. How about uh, you? Mine is someone we've talked about plenty. Claire Foy. She's there great. We go. She's amazing. This is for her role in First Man. It's awesome. Don't go see her Spider's Web movie because it sucks. Not because of her, but because it sucks. Not because of any of the performers, like Lakeith Stanfield, who is an amazing performer. Yeah. Because the movie sucks. So that's only, what I have to say. Only about. for the Claire Foy devotees. Yes. Fair enough. Not even for them, really. My best supporting actor... I went all over the place on this one, but I landed on Jesse Plemons in Game Night. Love it. Um, I just could not separate Best Supporting Actor with, like, Favorite Supporting Character. Well, did you hear um, the recommendation from uh, Michael Phillips, or I, maybe it was Josh Larson, um, Ethan Hawke's uh, forehead? <laughs> the <best laughs> first supporting. Reform. Ooh, yeah. That is a <laughs> lovely furrowed brow. It's very, 
that is an astute no, that's, observation. That's solid. Jesse's great in game night. Yeah, I mean, I, I surely could see someone argue that what he's doing isn't difficult. I think it's just perfect for the role. What good is like a great performance if if it's not just going to be your favorite? It might not be difficult. I think it's perfect for what it does in the movie. I think it's hilarious. Um, the divorcee neighbor who's maybe dangerous, probably just sad. Loved it. And the dog. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Well, my uh, favorite supporting actor of the year, I, I got to clarify from top because I certainly wouldn't say that it's like the best empirically or like mm. objectively. But my favorite is uh, actor in a Marvel movie, Michael Pena and Ant-Man and the Wasp. Okay. His, uh, he's my choice, much the way that Jesse Plemons is your choice because he's so fucking funny. Mm-hmm. and defines the backbone of the success of the film. Mm. I think that Michael Pena's uh, comedic um, timing and, and talents are the backbone of the Ant-Man series as it is now mm-hmm. and the Ant-Man character as it is represented now by Paul Rudd. And I think that Jesse Plemons is the backbone of Game Night with mm. his comedic chops um, and his ability to uh, manipulate the audience with his comic timing and manipulations of his face. I think Michael Penny is mm. more word oriented. Jesse mm-hmm. Plemons is more face oriented. Definitely. But they both have masterful timing, and I, I like both of her choices quite a bit. Love it. Great pick. Top actress. Top actress. We're going to Wildlife, Paul Dano's film. There We're she talking is. about Carrie Mulligan as Jeanette. I have not forgotten about Jeanette for a second since I watched Wildlife. Wildlife has really grown in my mind since watching it. Uh, and I think it has everything to do with her. Um, even though that film is through the eyes of uh, the boy at Oxenbold, um, I think that performance most definitely feels like a performance with a capital P. This isn't one that feels to me like it's just um, gritty realism. It feels like there is something kind of theatrical about it. Um, it is just dramatic acting of the highest order. I think it's just such a complicated role to see her kind of envisioning a new life for herself by just kind of trying to live it um, Mm -hmm. and just embodying it as she starts dating or getting involved with Bill Camp at the same time she's weirdly um, unwilling to face the fact that her marriage is maybe falling apart Um, I just think she just has it perfectly dialed in I loved it she's great she's great but she is no Claire Foy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Here we are. Mm. Back to Claire mm. Foy in Unsane. Uh, she's great. She's my favorite actress, not named Jennifer Lawrence, working at the mm. moment. Um, you know, Emily Blunt's right there, but Mary Poppins, for me, really didn't work. And mm. um, I'll wait till I see Jungle Cruise to, to see where I'm at with Emily at the moment. Um, mm. But I, I did consider Emily in a quiet place for best actress, I will mm. say. So Yeah. Um, best lead actor. Here we are. Honorable mention: Ethan Hawke in First Reformed. I really did like him. Now I will be thinking about his forehead for Ever. the rest of my days. Uh, but best actor, I actually went with Charlie Plummer in Lean on Pete. Like it? Yeah, solid choice. Um, so much of this movie is him just walking through Eastern Washington with a horse. Sometimes talking to himself, maybe talking to Pete. Sometimes not. Um, I think he just carries himself with. Um, loneliness mm-hmm. and sadness and um, when he does smile because he has Pete with him I think it's just monumental um, I think uh, he's right there um, with uh, Timothy Chalamet and Lucas Hedges as a uh, really talented uh, up and comer yeah he's one of the he had one of the best facial contortions I've seen from someone under 30 this mm. year yeah um what you well, got? My, I, let me do a, a honorable mention and a, a choice. So my honorable mention for best lead actor this year is uh, Christian Bale in Hostiles. Ah. Now my choice for best actor this year is Christian Bale in Vice. I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> what can I say? He's a transformative actor who gains and loses weight and becomes the character that he is uh, asked to become completely. Uh, He's never let me down, and this did not let me down in any way. And his 
transformation is the only reason the film works on any level. I think that anybody that doesn't like the film um, or says that the film doesn't work would probably still have to concede that Christian Bale at least made the film try. 100%. As one of those people who did not love Vice, I 100% loved Christian Bale. Yeah. And the performance is not is. the issue. It's it a it's a collage style film. As soon as I watched it, I honestly was like, I don't think Michael's going to like this. <laughs> Cuz I'm like, why did I like it? Cuz it's a performance. Mm-hmm. And then I'm interested in that collage style. Um, I think you're probably more interested in the collage style with really stunning photography in a documentary. Yeah, and, usually. And then acting outside of perfect form isn't going to redeem itself for you. So Yeah. But yeah. there's our quick review on Vice, since we'll never get to it. You're welcome, folks. Every, everybody in that movie, I think, really brings it. Um, I did not care for Amy Adams' turn. No? Oh, no. I was just going to say, I thought she was great. Yeah, I think that she was good. I think Alison Pill is better. Um, oh, yeah. As far as thinking about those. But, uh... You just watched Enchanted and you gave it a one-star review, so I don't think mm. you're the resident Amy Adams expert, sir. She is great. She is fantastic. That movie, not so much for me. I disagree. <laughs> it's a fun movie. Uh, all right, number two. Your number two feature film, because I don't have any. That's right. My number two is... You think that what we did together was a sin? I've seen enough real sin to know the difference. You didn't tell the police, right? Take a look at your own life before you criticize others. These are frightening times. We have to be patient. Well, somebody has to do something. Are you washed? Are you washed? In the blood. In the blood. In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? My hands shake as I write these lines. Polish Raiders first reformed. Wow. Okay. It has most definitely stuck with me. Ernst Toller's anguish and despair has uh, resonated uh, with me ever since I saw it. Um, I know some people aren't crazy about the ending. Um, I think uh, Tasha Robinson was one who She didn't... really did not like the ending. Right. Her, That's her, why it's, I'm um, probably remembering that now. It's just because I was shocked by how much she disliked it. Her <laughs> explanation of why she didn't like it actually really affected me when I was rewatching it. And that's the one thing where I like didn't I didn't quite come to her conclusion that it was just te- like terrible in that way but mm-hmm. I did see her point about how he's stacking up all this transcendental meaning throughout mm-hmm. the film and then he does not commit to how he would like the meaning to be interpreted mm-hmm. um, and I know that that was a very purposeful decision by him because I heard the interview where he uh, kept screening it for people and every time mm-hmm. they thought they knew what they saw he would mm. edit it so that they wouldn't know and he didn't mm. stop until people didn't know so I yeah. know it's really purposeful by him but I do see her point um, it's not really a point that I share but it is a point that does affect me in a similar way when mm. I watch the film yeah um, yeah. even though it's a, an incredibly different movie I would compare it a little bit to the ending of Lost in Translation which I think is just up for infinite interpretation despite there being plenty of visual evidence for one case or another whether what you was think the and what was the whisper? Is it platonic? Is it romantic? Is Ernst Toller uh, having a vision? Is this really happening? Um, I mean, I just need some degree of ambiguity for a movie to ever reach like the tippy top tier of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one that I'll have different thoughts about every time I think I revisit it. Um, and that. Well, now I know the next gift I'm going to send you. There you go. <laughs> Um, I think Ethan Hawke is is great. I think there's something about how this is so timely with how specific it is about his despair over climate change specifically. That is hyper specific, and yet what his feelings are seem very timeless. Um, mm-hmm. The sense of feeling hopeful yet also kind of despondent at the same time, and how you kind of reconcile those feelings feels timeless. Um, so my number two, yeah, first um, performed. One more thing. Amanda Seyfried is really, really, really good. Really good. And then I can't remember if he's billed as Cyril James or whatever, but for the common folk like me, Cedric the Entertainer mm. is just so goddamn good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's in my top 20, not in my top 10, which is really just a favorite 10. Yeah. Uh, my number two is a limited series on Netflix. Do you know where you are right now? 
I'm in a drug trial. What do you think is wrong with you? I'm sick. But I don't matter. What would you say this trial is showing you about yourself? Is this therapy now? It's not therapy. It's science. Once you begin to appreciate the structure of the mind, there's no reason to believe that anything about us can't be changed. Pain can be destroyed. The mind can be solved. From director, producer, creator, Kerry Joji Fukunaga, starring Emma Stone and Jonah Hill, it is Maniac. And it is one of my favorite narrative experiences of the year. Um, and I just keep thinking about it as a series and its creativity and originality and imagination. And um, I just really like the story that it told and how it goes about its storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. Just special to me the way that uh, True Detective is special to me when I when I think about limited series. It just it's in there. It's with Top of the Lake from uh, mm. uh, Jane Campion and Elizabeth Moss. It's just in there. Yeah. Our next Bond director, right? I think we already yes, talked about that. Yes, our next Bond director. Very excited to see what he brings to it. That would be pretty cool. If you want to hear our extended takes on Maniac, go find those episodes. Yeah. We did it. Well, yeah, I think when I was when I was doing my research for my Wounded Soldier, White Boy Rick, I read that that director, Jan Dimaj, was initially in line to be the next Bond director. Um, and then he got knocked out and Carrie took over. So I hope carry delivers because yeah. i like that director well originally the train spotting director was going to take over oh yeah danny boyle yeah. i'm sure there's been like five um there's only one true bond idris elba or tom hardy i don't care which <laughs> we shall see it's a great pick um, all right what are we at now directorial debuts we're finally here we're finally right. here okay 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 number three for you my number three As favorite of 10 minutes ago <laughs> directorial debut number three is Paul Dano's Wildlife here we are again Kerry Mulligan Jake Gyllenhaal Ed Oxenbold um, Bill Camp yeah like I said it's it's just stuck with me in a way I didn't expect it to I think there is a precision to his style um, that will really pay dividends um and visually just an incredibly pleasant beautiful film um his interest in just human experiences i think uh will uh be really interesting to follow it kills me that he did not make my list Oof. in fact i'm starting to think about changing it just so he can make it but i won't you can do uh, it number three a star is born oh nice cooper is a filmmaker that i think when he knows what he wants to make will be very um, entertaining to watch. Mm. And I really enjoyed my experience in the theater with The Star is Born. Um, it's not high art, but it's great art, and it's a crowd pleaser, and I think that it's good for most mature families. Yeah, yeah. Very close to my list. My only hesitation was with Bradley Cooper is that I wonder if he's really the one whose next film will bring something totally fresh and new to me um mo so much of what i love about star is born is the first half which does and then i think it gets into more familiar territory mm -hmm. i hope he goes um in a direction that is just uh more um even more s specific i guess um, I, I think he will get more narrow-minded in the next film perhaps that he makes yeah but i i would I would liken my expectation of, of him to begin to, to go towards that Americana style that I talk about. Yeah. That when I think about like Clint Eastwood um, or w what's his name? Midnight Special, Jeff. Oh, Jeff Nichols. Jeff yeah. Nichols. Yeah, I, I could see him getting deeper into that Midwest Americana vibe. Um, yeah. Critically acclaimed, destroyed the box office. If I were him, I'd be happy with it. Yeah, I, I think he did. I think right. he did okay. Uh, number two. Corey Finley's Thoroughbreds. Me too. Really? Nice. Cool pick. Uh, yeah. It's uh, one... ATJ all day. 
ATJ, Olivia Cook, Anton Yelchin, he was also very close uh, for a Best Supporting role. Mm -hmm. He was hilarious in that. I I had to go back and... It's been forever since I watched that. I had to go back and just watch some clips, and he's so funny. I watched it a few times uh, in theaters. Thanks, Movie Pass. Yeah, the the stoner who thinks, you know, the 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 drug dealing... The bathtub scene. It's just gold. Um, Uh, And then, what's his name? I can't remember his name, but he's the writer in the House of Cards series, uh, who plays mm. the dad. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. But yeah, he, great he was stuff. great, too. Yeah. yeah, really, really spectacular eye. Definitely. How What's about you? Number, well, I, we just did it. Number one. That's right. My number one is Hereditary, also high up on my list of top ten. Uh, you want to guess what mine is? Um, I thought it was going to be Hereditary. I don't know. It's Den of the... No, it's Hereditary. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> You had me worried there. Yeah, no, it's it's hereditary. I think we both like this movie pretty good, pretty good. It's a good one. It's very scary. He, he's uh, I think that in a decade out of all the directors we've gone over, he will be the most uh, accomplished and the most exciting director that we've watched. However, if I were to talk to you about in thirty or forty years when we examine the uh, the whole work, I do think that Paul Dano's work will stand out. Hmm. That's interesting. Just to break yeah. down our choices there real quick. Yeah. Uh, and how I think about them. Exciting new voices. Uh, all right. Well, let's get to number one. Shall Feature we? Feature film from you. Are you ready? I am ready. Are you ready for our number ones? I hope so. Listener, are you ready? I know I it's not if Beale Street could talk, so I'm confused. My number one, kind of by a mile, is... <laughs> Burning. Oh yeah. Lee Chang Dong's Burning. Foreign films. Yes. Um, like I said with first reform, a, a degree of ambiguity is just critical. Uh, in my appreciation for a movie and this has an abundance of ambiguity I think Um, I just uh, adore these performances and I just think that beyond being sort of a mystery at a narrative level I think the filmmaking just gets at um, what the essence of of mystery feels like in in how uh, the camera moves and how these people fit within the frame um uh, I was just um, not a not a single other film came close to hypnotizing me like Burning did. I was completely <laughs> spellbound, um, and uh, it's the only one that I just cannot wait to revisit and buy and just uh, watch many times uh, well, in the future. Pardon? You have a copy? I do have a copy. <laughs> uh, it, it is a singular film. Um, I think I can see what you're saying because I think about Roma and I think about Suspiria when you talk about that that um, I don't remember the word you just said but that, that pulling sense of suspense mm. and I, I think that Suspiria and Roma have those moments but I think that they are interbroken by their their plot mechanics mm. whereas yeah. uh, what Haruki Murakami's adapted screenplay here yeah um allows Lee Chang Dong to really use swells of music um against Mm. silence and against uh, weird lingering moments against weird loud moments um yeah this is a singular film um really glad I watched it it just kind of like the killing of a sacred deer it really disaffected me Mm. um because of its talent and technical proficiency and mm. expert use of everything that it does. It's so good, and it pushed me away so effectively mm. that I just didn't respond well to it the way that you did. Yeah, yeah. That's my number one. What's yours? My number one is, once again, not a feature film. It is... Olivia was hit on the jaw on the left side of her face by somebody who's right-handed. Your right hand was bruised red and swollen pour me something tall and muscular trying to decide if i should invite you in what was it about olivia that drew these men to her she was 
was reckless. She was being Olivia. You seem strong. Are you handy? Some scene today as the frozen body of Olivia Lake was discovered. Back to Steven Soderbergh. Steven Soderbergh's HBO miniseries Mosaic, which was also released as an app in 2017. Mm. Um, it is an immersive narrative. It has an incredible ensemble. It has great performances from that ensemble. It has what I think is one of the freshest takes on noir I've seen all year. Mm. Um, it's also something that uh, to quote Peter Labuza directly, suffers from perfect shotitis. Mm. Uh, he and uh, Keith Ulick la- uh, put this in their uh, favorite stuff of 2017. Gotcha. Um, and that was Peter Labuza's exact quote there. Uh, it suffers from perfect shotitis, and I perfectly agree. It is one of the most uh, sumptuously directed things I've seen all year. Yeah. And I love it. It's got Sharon Stone, Garrett Hedlund, Paul Rubens. Jennifer Farron, Bo Bridges. Uh, it's special. It is unique. You haven't seen it yet. Blind despite spot. Despite my urging Big for blind almost spot. Uh, half a year. Um, and everyone can watch it on HBO. Uh, small tangent. It was recently announced on Monday that they uh, have um, begun pre-production on season two of Mosaic. Ooh, which nice. completely breaks my mind open. Mm. And I don't understand it. It has to be an anthology, mm. I think. Like, they can't do this again. They have to go to Colorado instead of Utah or something. Mm. But I am 100% on board if Soderbergh is attached. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, who is the lead actress in it? Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone, yes. I do love Sharon Stone. Yeah, the Stone girls were really good this year. Between Emma mm. and Sharon, yeah. Great pick. Big, big blind is, spot for me. That is my number one of the year. Um, now we we get to our favorite classic discovery on the podcast. Uh, this is where we just pick a movie that we watched only because the podcast exists and we got around to it. Yeah. What's yours? I had many to choose from. This is actually a very difficult category for me. Um, but at number three, I have Predator, John McTiernan. I've never seen Predator before. Oh, wow. That's great. We watched it. Oh, we were supposed to do three? I did three. Oh, shit. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I'll do I'll do my top two, or I'll do my third and second quickly then. Predator at number three, John McTiernan. Uh, the Predator sucked. That's yes, why we watched this. This movie does not. I was a very big fan. And number two was Wanda, Barbara Loden. We did a Loden. Fest. Fest on our Women in White episode. Uh, episode really enjoyed four. that. Yep. Uh, how about you? What's your number one? My number one is Brian De Palma's Blowout. Oh, yeah. I had never seen that movie, and I still think about lots of the shots constantly. When I watch movies, I think about Brian De Palma more often than most directors when I think like, oh, that's a Brian De Palma shot. Mm. Uh, and it's it's fun to broaden that category of, oh, you stole that from Brian De Palma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm going to change mine, actually. I, I I had two dueling for number one. I was going to do Out of the Past, but I'm going to do Dracula, actually, instead. I've, I think I was thinking about Dracula. Dracula was, was really something special. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, specifically, just formally dazzling, um, a familiar story told in just and brilliant And potentially, form. I don't know if you've heard this in the news, mm. but it is quite possible because a Roman Catholic priest actually performed the um it, within the role they actually had a roman catholic priest when winona Ryder and keanu reeves get married in the film they might actually be married that is amazing <laughs> <laughs> that is literally the best bit of celebrity news i've heard in a long time and i think that came that out hilarious. of the, uh, the media circuit during their press for uh Destination Wedding, which is a great little so uh, funny. buddy comedy romance between Winona Ryder and Keanu Reeves. That is absolutely hilarious. I love that. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, and now we arrive at our top three technically desirable, dazzling, beautiful films of the year. However you want to break it down. Whether it's, um, you know, things that are, are beautiful to look at and technically mm. dazzling, or if there's something that they're doing at a technical level in its presentation that you love um, i think that you're mm. going to go with beauty and 
desirable and I'm going to go with yeah. things that totally blow my mind um, on the user experience end. Yeah, all three of my picks, I mean, they're, they're just kind of different. They kind of fit the definition differently, so I don't know that the, the order really matters. Uh, you want me to go first? Yeah. All right, at number three, I have First Man. Visually dazzling, for sure, but I was really thinking about First Man for sound. In mm -hmm. a way, that's really what sound I remember. Great. Um, the you roar, know, the fire. Yeah, the the ricketiness of those rockets, the, the slamming oh, shut of the door, bolts. the sound of, uh, you know... Uh, that explosion when mm -hmm. the four or so guys are locked in uh, that ship. I mean, I just feel like I could close my eyes and still get a sense for just how um, kind of primitively built these rockets are um, that these guys are getting getting shot up in. Um, I thought the sound was really sort of incredible. Uh, that's my number three. How about you? My number three is Peter Jackson's documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old. Um, it's a good documentary. It's not a particularly great documentary because the footage is quite limited. But the reason why I chose it for number three is because it is one of the most important things that happened in 2018 to prove that you can restore footage that's 100 years old to look this way. I saw it in 3D. Yeah. I saw 100-year-old footage restored in 3D. That is mind-blowing, and that is one of the most important developments um, that will continue to affect humans and how we interpret human history and can review the history of our species for centuries to come. Great pick. One that I missed, sadly. I hope it just gets it a regular will, will distribution. It, uh, it's going to receive a wide release distribution in March, and it'll be part of the AMC A-list titles, yeah. so you'll be fine. I like it. Uh, my number two, relatively small. I'm going with Golden Exits, the Alex Ross Perry film here. I um, saw that. I, I think like there it. were there were yeah there were a handful of films this year that kind of went for a grainy, um, nostalgic kind of aesthetic. Um, the Old Man and the Gun was one, um, which I very much liked. Uh, First Man kind of did something similar too. Um, and Golden Exits, uh, the cinematographer here is is the Sean Price Williams. He's become one of my favorites. Um, you know, this is a small character-driven film, but uh, if if I had to pick one thing that I really, really love about this film, it is the cinematography. Um, Me I just too. Think, I think about a lot of those yeah, moments. The way he can bring light into his camera, I think, is just really special. Um, There's something about movement with the exits and oh, the yeah. entrances of those doorways and the offices, though. Yeah. Um, and I think her apartment, we get some of those scenes, and she's got a stoop, if I remember correctly. Yeah. A concrete stair stoop. Um, and it's shot so well that it's burned into my mind. And I saw this in like January or February. And oh, I can yeah. still recall those images. That's how powerful what you're talking about is. Yeah, 100% agree. They've really stuck with me. Um, I think the blonde gal in that movie, who's also an American Horror Story, is Lily Rabe. R-A-B-E. Is that how you pronounce her last name? And you're um, talking about the main character? The other blonde that's not Chloe Sav Savini in Golden Exits. Um, I'm just not sure okay, how to pronounce so her last name. Okay, so the main girl in Golden Exits isn't either of those people. I'm talking about that gal. Oh, gotcha. Lily Rabe, right? Gotcha. Just R-A-B-E? Yeah, I, Rabe? I would imagine. I thought you were talking about um, Emily Browning. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, there is a, there's a particular shot of uh, Lily, Brabe, Lily Rabe at the bottom of a staircase, and he's... Um, capturing like light coming through the top of their staircase through like a little a stained glass window they have mm -hmm. and there's just uh, a refraction of light oh. kind of behind her I think yeah. it's in the trailer as well um, and you know most of these people in this movie are, un are unhappy they're all kind of just trying to Besides make sense of their relationships and I just think the way uh, he handles light somehow captures that melancholy uh, feeling running through it um, Golden Exits I loved it how about you? Number two. Number two. Uh, my number two is a film that I think you haven't seen. Um, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I don't know every single mm. detail the way that Tasha Robinson does. So tune mm. in to Film Spotting and listen to Tasha Robinson break down all that stuff. But what I can tell you is that the traditional uh, CG modeling um, methods of doing animation did not work for their vision of this film. So they had to completely tear it down and build a brand new um, mm. they had to build a brand new engine um, Got it. for the way that they wanted to layer the cell effect with the um, movement mm. and the, the buildings in the background they had to build it from scratch you know this mm. is something that it took Disney 15 20 years to do with Pixar mm. animation uh, starting in the late 70s early 80s um, and it's just 
it's incredible. It's not only an incredible film; it's it's an incredible technology that we're going to get to see mm. for at least a decade to come. Uh, they're they're working on the sequel right now. It is doing big box office bucks. Yeah, I got to see it in uh, IMAX 3D. It was a fucking blast. One of one of the the most enjoyable experiences I had. I was not one of the teenage girls crying in the audience. Ooh, wow! I was very surprised by those. But I was one of the the middle aged men going, "Yay! This is awesome! This is so what seven year old me wanted to see when I grew up." Like, it's uh, I put in my review. This is the best uh, animated superhero film since Mask of the Phantasm. Oh and yeah, I stand by that. Big blind spot for me. Got to catch up with it. Fortunately, still can. Still in theaters. Yep. Very, very, There's uh, very fresh. There's a lot of 10.30, I'm, uh, not IMAX, but 10.30 Real D 3D showings. Ah, there you go. Uh, your number one. My number one is Isle of Dogs, the Wes Anderson wow. film. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Our number ones are going to be each other's bane of existence, but that's cool. There we go. Uh, the Isle of Dogs, one of Kendall's, uh, Kendall Goldberg of When Jeff Tried to Save the World's favorite films of the year. That's right great pick uh the meticulously handcrafted aesthetic is just right up my alley um it is really well done. using you know everything from cotton balls to depict a dust storm as uh, a group of dogs wrestle with each other to the way the camera is panning across these um little miniature uh puppet filled dioramas i think is just uh, a total feat um it's you know faded a bit since it was so early in the year it was on my list at one point um, on a rewatch, it certainly could be. Um, if there's anything I love about that movie, first and foremost, it's the craft, and uh, that's number one. Isle of Dogs. My number one, you gave one star to. Uh-oh. What was that? Black Mirror Bandersnatch. Oh. oh, very very fresh for me. Very fresh for me as well. Um, well, mostly fresh. I think mm. I watched it about eight days ago. Yep. Um, the choose-your-own-adventure style... Um, I I did not get to experience Mosaic that way first. I've since done most of Mosaic in the Android um, Mosaic app where you do choose your own adventure. Um, But what Bandersnatch does from a technical level and the user end experience, I can definitely understand all the people that are having problems with the film. But from a, a technical standpoint of shooting 480 minutes of film and then allowing the end user to make choices and navigate through that narrative in wholly original ways that are unique to the person is very reminiscent of Telltale Games' uh, games, now shuttered uh, game studio, Telltale Games. Um, and I really, I, I really value the storytelling experience um, a, as a viewer of film, and I think that this is one of the most enjoyable experiences I had all year doing so. I watched it with uh, my friend, and we sat here where we're sitting right now, and we had my Xbox controller, and we were like, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? And we were so excited and thrilled with the choices, and uh, when that timer's ticking down, we were like, well, if we do this, this might happen, and if we do that, that might happen. But be quick. If, if, we, if we're if we really careful and we make sure that we kill ourselves right after we do this, because I think we can kill ourselves if we make this next choice, then we can try this one out so that we can go back and repeat this sequence. It was just so fun to uh, to share that experience. I don't know how good it would work independently, maybe. Um, I know you got to watch it with someone, too. I did. Um, and mm-hmm. it worked a little bit better for her than it did for you. That's correct. Based on her bit. review. Yeah. Um, or at least her rating. But, yeah, uh, yeah this, this one is really uh, close to my heart because I, I not only love the Black Mirror experience uh, of the, the show, I love choose your own adventure so much and there's a lot more to dive into i wish that we could review the whole film maybe we yeah. will later but because there's a lot to say well i'm um, yeah i'm sure there will be plenty more like it to come in a formal sense well, it's, many it's, more interactive it was right? very technically um expensive oh, I believe and, yeah. and uh costly it, it just yeah. uh, to everyone in, involved because of all the all the stuff it was very very hard for them to pull off yeah. I, I would not expect to see more than three of these a year per platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not an easy thing to pull off. Because you have to get an, uh, you know, a really reliable director who can't be, who isn't the main focus of, you know, the Disney or DC franchises, who can give you that same reliability. Yeah, 
for one so if if 120 minutes is a film then they've got to shoot four films for you per year for you to assemble one of these suckers yeah based on this version so yeah quite a task yeah sure is in true drink in the movies fashion the last movie we will talk about is as a wide almost as wide of a split as we could have (laughs) (laughs) i gave it a five you gave it a one the conversation Um, will go on so as it should (laughs) um well that that is our top of 2018 good on you michael uh quite a year should we read them uh jared bratt the director uh and star or co-director and star of streamers uh top choices and then we'll get to uh kendall goldberg the director of when jeff tried to save the world yeah, absolutely. So I'll read Jared Bratt's top films. His uh, top three, it looks like in no particular order, were Mandy, You Were Never Really Here, and Mission Impossible Fallout. Um, he has a few other favorites here. He has Climax, Creed II, The Favorite, First Reformed, Halloween, Mid-90s. That didn't come up. I kind of thought didn't. it might. I did that, too. Hard to leave that off. Great pick. Uh, and Roma, of course. Of course. Uh Kendall Goldberg uh, has 15 movies that she sent us in no particular order that she just really liked. She couldn't boil them down. Um, Infinity War, which I really wanted to include in multiple levels. I just couldn't. I I actually had it until Bandersnatch came out in technical Uh, proficiency because I saw it in IMAX 3D and it's a great choice. Black Panther, I personally didn't care for. It's definitely doing well for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. Yeah. Isle of Dogs. That's you. Blind Spotting. A movie I really responded well to. I just haven't Mm. really revisited. Um, Searching. We didn't care for that one, but I definitely hear everyone saying We seem to be on the outs there. We really are. (laughs) Eighth Grade from Bo Burnham. I can't believe this directorial debut didn't come up. I make Gucci jokes all the time. We we reference it (laughs) a lot. (laughs) That's probably the first thing I said to you today. Yes. Uh, Shoplifters. Great choice. Solid. Came up already. Leave No Trace. Amazing, beautiful film. Roma, once again, one of my favorites. We the Animals, something I didn't personally respond well to. A lot of Mm -hmm. people are, though. Another one. I think we're on the outs there. Yeah. Yeah. Shirkers, film you love. Great pick. Love it. I'm not the biggest scene. Don't listen to Taylor. Mission Impossible Fallout. Heck yes. Game Night. Absolutely. A simple favor. Yes. Uniform agreement there. Simple favor. Great pick. All right, why don't you go one more time through your top 10? Gotta pull it up. That's all right. That's what the editing is for. All right. From 10 down to 1, my number 10, Cold War. Number 9, Lean on Pete. Number 8, The Writer. Number 7, Support the Girls. Number 6, Suspiria. Number 5, Private Life. Number 4, Hereditary. Number three, If Beale Street Could Talk. Number two, First Reformed. And number one, Burning. How about you? Did you get it? Did you get that little hereditary joke? Huh? That scares me. Don't do that. My number 10, Mission Impossible Fallout. Number nine, The House That Jack Built. Number eight, First Man. Number seven, The Favorite. Number six, Unsane. Number five, If Beale Street Could Talk. Number four, Roma. Number three, Hostiles. Number two, the limited Netflix series Maniac. And number one, Steven Soderbergh's HBO series Mosaic. That's it. That's 2018 a wrap. is wrapped. <sighs> Moving on. All right. So for next episode, give them a little bit of a breakdown. I gave you two Nicholas Vending Refn films. You gave me right. two films. Uh, you say what you gave me and then I'll say what I gave you, I guess, or vice versa. I don't care. I gave you a David McKenzie film called Start Up, yep. a uh, prison drama, as well as a lo-fi sci-fi flick called Coherence, mm-hmm. uh, both streaming titles, I believe. And then I gave you Nicholas Vending Refn's, uh, shoot, now I'm, <laughs> now I'm blanking on them. I had to look them up when I gave them to you as well. Valhalla Rising. Uh, Valhalla Rising, and then the other one is Bronson with yes. Tom Hardy. Um and we will be watching those titles. Uh, well, you'll be watching the Refn titles, and I'll be watching the lo-fi sci-fi and the uh, uh, David Lean film. David McKenzie. Yep. David McKenzie. Yep. Shoot, David Lean is Lionel Pete. No, I'm just mixing. <laughs> uh, 
That's uh, Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? Ah, uh, damn you, Josh Larson, <laughs> bringing up David Lean all the time. Um, so we'll be watching those and then talking about our experiences with them at the other's behest. Uh, That's right. And then um, I think we'll be doing Glass on the next oh, episode. Yeah. Um, is there any other films that you wanted to talk about on the next episode besides those? I got to look at the uh, calendar and see what else is coming out. Yeah. January is usually a little dry. Well, it people is. are catching up, you know, with uh, 2018 flicks as they should. Um, but I think Glass is a solid choice. Um, I don't really want to talk about Escape Room. Yeah, but... I just saw Escape Room. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. Well, uh, because you're not going to see it because you don't deserve to do that. I to appreciate yourself. you doing that for the podcast. Yeah, I'm gonna. Know. We'll take a look. Yeah, I, I checked it out. I got my number three AMC A list in, and mm. it was not worth watching three films that week. I tell you what, you tried. I had all the faith in Deborah Ann Wool, and I still do, but that movie sucked. Dang it! All right, well, that is it for 2018. Uh, I guess next episode we will also get back to doing um, first impressions. Oh, yeah. And to follow up first impressions, we will give you our first impressions of the year where yeah. we'll maybe each have a top five films that we expect to be our favorites of the year. Most anticipated. You got to yeah, start off the year with what our outlook looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Ad like Astra it. might come up. Oh, I think so. That's it from Drinking the Movies. It's always a pleasure. Cheers. Run! Go! Get to the chopper! We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant. You're the best!